Greetings in our Savior's name. And today is the third Sunday in Advent. I will be preaching on Zephaniah, our Old Testament lesson, and I read that now. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O Israel. Rejoice and be glad with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival, so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time I will bring you in, at the time when I gather you together. For I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for this morning's message, as I said, is the Old Testament out of Zephaniah, and especially verses 14 and 15. My dear friends in Christ, if I had to guess, I would guess that most of you are not very familiar with the book of Zephaniah in the Old Testament. I would also guess that it doesn't even come close to being in the top 10 books that people read out of the Bible. No one who says, well, I'm going to read the Bible, hears someone else say to them, well, make sure you begin with the book of Zephaniah. And so if this morning's Old Testament lesson is really your introduction to the book of Zephaniah, you may be left with the impression that the book of Zephaniah is filled with good news for God's people. In fact, our entire lesson this morning is good news, and not just good news, but good news that requires that God asks and commands us to sing about. Sing, shout aloud, be glad and rejoice with all your heart. These are all imperatives, commanding God's people to sing in our Old Testament lesson today. And yet, if you actually read the entire book of Zephaniah, you may begin to ask yourself, well, what exactly is there to sing about? The first two chapters of Zephaniah are filled with God's judgment upon the world. The first chapter is filled with threat, warning, and judgment against Judah and Jerusalem because it had committed idolatry. Zephaniah 1. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all who live in Jerusalem. I will cut off from this place every remnant of Baal, the names of the pagan and idolatrous priests, those who bow down on the roofs to the starry host, those who bow down and swear by the Lord, and who also swear by Molech. It isn't one false god getting Judah's attention, it is many of them. Baal, Molech, and even astrology, that is, the starry hosts. Horoscopes aren't a new idolatry among us. And so God declares judgment on his own people in Judah, in Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, by the end of Zephaniah 1, God is not only declaring judgment, but is pronouncing a day of wrath, a day of judgment that is to come. Turning to chapter 2, things don't get any rosier. Now, instead of Judah and Jerusalem being in God's crosshairs, God speaks his wrath against the other nations of the earth against Philistia, and Moab, and Ammon, and Cush, and Assyria. Chapter 2 of Zephaniah is all, woe to you, and you're going to get what you deserve. Here's just a snippet of what the Lord says to those other nations. This is what they will get in return for their pride, for insulting and mocking the people of the Lord Almighty. The Lord will be awesome, awesome to them when he destroys all the gods of the land, the nations on every shore will worship him, everyone in its own land. Of course, here, awesome is not the way we use it today as in good, but awesome as in powerful 
and destructive and time to run for cover awesome. And so the first two chapters of the book of Zephaniah are really all about judgment, all about wrath, even against God's own people. And yet at the end of all that, at the end of all that judgment and wrath, God commands his people to do what? To sing. How could God expect that after all he had just said that he was going to do, that his people would sing? But he commands them to do so. God can command them to do so. He can call upon his people to sing, be glad and rejoice, because he's going to change things. He's going to change their outlook, their outcome, and their perspective. He commands them to sing. He calls on them to sing by getting them to look not only at what he is doing in judgment, but what else this glorious and loving God is doing. Instead of keeping their eyes focused upon the wrath among the idol of God among the idolaters among them, God reminds them that he will take away their punishment and they will never again need to fear any harm. God's people can and must sing because God is with them and he is mighty to save. God's people can and must sing because he is going to remove their sorrows and deal harshly with those who have dealt harshly with them. God's people can and must sing because he is their God and they are his people. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart because of all that God is going to do. And so God says to us, sing. Sing, O children of Almaden. Shout aloud, shepherd of the valley. Be glad and rejoice, congregation. What's that? You don't feel much like singing? How can I sing, pastor, when I have these kinds of things going on in my life? How can I sing when my wife, my husband, my mother, my father is sick? How can I sing when my family faces such difficulty? Sing? Have you looked out your stained glass windows, pastor, at the world? How can I sing when the world is so broken? and seemingly more so every day. Sing. You've got to be kidding. I do well enough to just get up and get through my day. Sing? Not going to happen. God's imperatives to us, sing, don't change because of our circumstance. God calls on you. God implores you. God commands you to sing. Perhaps, perhaps especially because of your circumstances, we sing. Maybe it's like that old saying, act as if you have faith, and faith you will have. Maybe if we sing with joy, then joy we will have. I think the idea of singing, even when there isn't much to sing about, lies at the heart of of most of our hymns and good, so and good Christian songs. They're born out of tragedy. They're born from authors whose lives weren't going as they had hoped. One of my favorite Christmas hymns is I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. It's written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And it isn't your typical Christmas song. It isn't focused on joy and manger, shepherd and angels. Instead, it's a hymn born from the heart of a man with deep sadness. Longfellow lost his first wife shortly after they were married. Within about a year, she fell ill and died. He remarried ten years later, and he and his wife had five children, and life seemed to be going swimmingly. Then, unfortunately, Longfellow lost his second wife, who died in a fire. And then the Civil War began. And his eldest son was sent off to battle. And his eldest son was wounded, deeply wounded in battle, and returned home. And it was in the midst of the heartbreaking time of the Civil War that Longfellow writes the lyrics to I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. 
The original lyrics actually demonstrate that it was written during the Civil War. Let me read just a couple of verses to you. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet their words repeat of peace on earth and goodwill to men. And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then from each black accursed mouth, the cannon thundered in the south, and with the sound the carols drowned of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then peal the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. Those are just a few of the verses, but you get the idea. Even in the face of such tragedy and circumstance, the loss of two wives, the wounding of a son, and the tearing apart of a country that he loves so deeply, Longfellow is moved to write lyrics, lyrics to be sung. It is God's strength that will deliver. It is God's strength that will bring him through these times. For God is not dead, nor does he sleep. So then, my brothers and sisters in Christ, sing. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart. And when you find no music in your heart because your heart is broken, when you find that no lyric can pass your lips because they quiver with hurt and anxiety, when your hands cannot strum a guitar and your fingers cannot play a piano because they shake with emotion, look again to God. Remember his promises to you. Remember he delivers. He is always with you and will never forsake you because he has promised to do so. He delivers all things into your life for your, for your eternal good. He has promised it. He has sent his son to die and rise that you too might rise again. He has promised it. Remember those things and sing. Sing as if you had joy and joy you shall have. To God be the glory now and forevermore. Amen.